What a great run. We are so thrilled about the wonderful work students did for the hackathon. Heartfelt congratulations to all of you. To close our second day of A Better Tech, we want to turn to industry and explore how companies can be places for building successful public interest technology careers. And who would be better suited to give us insight into this topic than one of the people who have built up the space of public interest tech from the ground, cutting across disciplines? Dr. Ruman Chaudhary. Dr. Chaudhary's passion lies at the intersection of artificial intelligence and humanity. She's a pioneer in the field of applied algorithmic ethics, creating cutting-edge socio-technical solutions for ethical, explainable, and transparent AI. She currently is the director of Meta, which is the ML ethics, transparency, and accountability team at Twitter, leading a team of applied researchers and engineers to identify and mitigate algorithmic harms on the platform. Previously, she was CEO and founder of Parity, an enterprise algorithmic audit platform company. She formerly served as global leader for responsible AI at Accenture Applied Intelligence. Dr. Chowdhury is dedicated to cultivating and growing the next wave of technology forward companies, enabling the responsible use of emerging technologies. She's general partner and founder of the Parity Responsible Innovation Venture Capital Fund. She also serves as the mentor for the Creative Destruction Lab and as a board member of multiple inclusive tech organizations. Today, Dr. Chowdhury will be in conversation with Lauren Langster, who is a current undergraduate student at New York University, where she studies science and technology studies and mechanical engineering. She has experience in business development and strategy operation roles within the aerospace, defense, and telecommunications industry. Her interests are in ethical practices and diversity and inclusion in the national security and aerospace industry. Thank you both infinitely for joining us today. And I'm going to send it over to you, Lauren. for being here and everybody for watching. I'd like to start by asking you about what you do and how you describe what you do today in your roles. Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me on. Um, so I am the director of a team called Meta, Machine Learning Ethics, Transparency and Accountability on the popular social media platform, Twitter. My team consists of engineers and researchers who are doing research into the impact of social media on the public, as well as understanding potential ethical biases of our algorithms and creating the right kind of environment, educational, as well as tools for engineers to be able to self-serve and identifying harms and biases in their algorithms. And what was your path towards becoming a public interest technologist? So I am a quantitative social scientist by training. Um, my work has been in political science, but also I'm really, inter really interested in methods. Um, so I have uh, undergrad degrees from MIT, a master's in quantitative methods of the social sciences from Columbia, and a PhD in political science from UCSD. Um, but I have always been interested in how we can learn about humanity and improve the human condition by using data and understanding data. And it's really, really fascinating to me to take both qualitative and quantitative analyses and sort of combine the two to create good socio-technical learnings. So with all of that being said, could you go into a little bit more detail about what your role entails and what you specifically work on on the team? Absolutely. So Meta is a really unique team in industry in general. So as I mentioned, we are researchers and engineers, um, and we also sit as part of a core engineering function at Twitter. So we're part of this team called Cortex, which is where all of the machine learning tooling is developed. So why that's interesting and why that's a little bit different is, you know, my peers are engineering managers, engineering directors. So when we all sit in a room and people are talking about building new ML systems, et cetera, I am there with them in the decision making. Um, so it's, you know, 
we also do a lot of work outside of engineering. I work very closely with our public policy team, our legal team, our risk and compliance team. And, you know, the really fascinating part about a role like mine and a team like Meta is it's this sort of very representative of what public interest technology is, which is sort of taking in all the perspectives of different kinds of people and different kinds of roles and combining them into creating a better platform and a better product and experience for all people who are on the platform. And so outside of Twitter, is there other public interest technologist work that you are a part of or that you like taking part of? Absolutely. So uh, I have been fortunate to be part of a lot of governance initiatives. Uh, as a political scientist, I can't help but want to be involved in a lot of the really interesting cutting edge work being done in uh, creating uh, and crafting um, regulation, guidelines, standards, etc. Um, I sit on multiple boards, including AI for All, um, and I also have just been added to the board of the UNESCO, um, you know, Broadband Commission uh, for the UN. Um, so, you know, it's really interesting, and, and I am very fortunate to work with people all over the world from all different levels of expertise um, who all want to contribute to making better tech, uh, you know, in their own way. And Additionally, you also have a VC fund, and I was wondering if you could speak more about that, too. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I suppose it maybe sounds a little bit uh, contradictory to say, hey, we're trying to build better tech and like, oh, I also have a VC fund. And I know all the stereotypes about VCs. Uh, and absolutely, I, I, I love joking about them as well. But so Parity Responsible Innovation Fund is meant to create that ecosystem of companies that will enable other organizations to build responsible and ethical tech. And we have a very specific definition of what responsible innovation means. We define it as privacy, security, compliance, and ethics. And very specifically, what we are interested in is funding the next wave of startups that are diverse, that are globally minded, that are ethically minded, that are creating the kinds of products so that companies can take action and ensure their technologies are used responsibly. So within the realm of privacy, I've been learning a lot and we've been investing in companies um, that work on privacy preserving machine learning. You may have been hearing about things like differential privacy or homomorphic encryption uh, or cryptographic safe rooms, like stuff like that. Um, in security, we're really interested in investing in companies who are doing ML security. So how do you identify and find malicious actors and make sure that you know fraud or adverse events don't happen because someone has hacked into your AI system or gamed the system? Um, and for ethics and compliance, you know, pretty evident, but that's sort of the world that I come from, uh, which is sort of creating the next wave of algorithmic audit tools, bias detection tools, um, and also ensuring even basic compliance with the law. So when we look at a lot of the algorithms that exist today, um, you know, a lot of regulators are trying to figure out how do we even investigate them to see if biases can happen. So we're investing in a wide range of companies that are thinking about responsible innovation. And with your work with Twitter or even outside of Twitter, I'm sure as a public interest technologist, you run into some pretty big challenges. So I wonder if you could speak on those and then also talk about the benefits that, you know, might outweigh those. Sure. Um, so, you know, we'll start with the challenges and we'll talk about the benefits. Um, so as a new field, sometimes people don't really understand what we do. Um, I think a lot of people today, and it took years to get people on board and to really understand the importance of public interest technology and responsible ML and responsible innovation, a lot of people understand and appreciate the narrative. They like the idea. They, people generally agree that we want tech that's benefiting humanity, that's not discriminatory or biased. But what it means to get there is not really things that people often understand. And sometimes, you know, it is hard to get people to understand that, you know, we have actual tangible tools for them to use. We're building machine learning technologies and there are techniques that can be applied and my team is here to help. Um, and also, you know, we're not here to be in this combative situation where we're framing engineers as these like evil people and we're here to stop them from doing evil things. And, you know, at the end of the day, we all have the same shared goal and it's to create a better product. And we create a better product by making sure everyone's able to use it and enjoy it and benefit from it, right? Um, so that's kind of one of the challenges. I think another challenge is, frankly, there are not a lot of people who are even trained in this field because it is very, very new. And this is why events like A Better Tech are very encouraging that, you know, we do, you know, for those of us who have 
or kind of the earliest people in the field to lay a bit of groundwork of like, this is the kind of work that you want to be doing when you're in a company and like, here's how you can have impact. So it is a little hard to find people um, who have been experts in the field, especially in engineering. So when I hire more senior engineers, I'm really not going to find that there are very, very few people who have done applied ethical AI engineering and I can hire into my team. But again, like no lack of enthusiasm. There's a lot of really enthusiastic people. My team alone has grown over 300% since I joined in March. Um, and I'm very, very proud of every single person we've hired. And we have an incredibly stellar team who's really hardworking. So I guess I just started to talk about the benefits. <laughs> um, I will genuinely say that I wake up every day thrilled to go to work. And, you know, that is a gift. You know, we have all had jobs and we're like, got to do this to pay the bills, you know, and I am in the opposite camp where I wish there were more hours in the day and I wish I didn't have to sleep because then I could just keep doing my day job. Um, and, you know, I, I get to do so like if you are a person who likes to use every part of your brain, this field is the field to be in because it's genuinely exciting from all angles. Um, so I am very fortunate, as I mentioned, to have a really stellar team working for me and with me, whether they have been here one month or five years at Twitter. Um, and what I love is that if you are somebody who enjoys, a, you know, being pioneering, and I, I always jokingly say, I enjoy making order out of chaos. Uh, if you're somebody who enjoys that and sort of walking the road less travels, this is absolutely a field for you. And would you, so in your opinion, is the setup or the framework that Twitter has with engineers and researchers all in the same team and having a voice at that table, would you recommend that uh, throughout the board? Yeah, that's that's a really great question, Lauren. So there is, because of the newness of this field, I think sometimes folks don't know where to place a team like Meta and different organizations sort of place it in different ways or they prioritize it in different ways. So um, actually upcoming at CSCW, a conference that's happening quite soon, uh, a few of us will be presenting research that we did a year ago. Um, so a few of us is actually from my time when I was working at Accenture, uh, Bogdana Rakova, who's on my team at Accenture, Henriette Kramer, who leads Responsible ML at Spotify, and Jinying Yang, formerly of Partnership on AI, who's now at Georgia Tech. We actually did an interview of people who work in, um, in this industry and we asked them essentially like, where are you today? What is your ideal state? And where do you see this field heading? And you know, what would you need to get there? And what you're asking is kind of the, what have people articulated that they need to get there? Um, which I see as like some success metrics. So there's a few success metrics that are really important. One is tone from the top, which is, you know, leadership has to be behind it. And if leadership is not behind it, you're not going to be successful. Uh, the second thing I look at is, how much access to leadership do you have? And frankly, at Twitter, I have pretty significant access to leadership and I'm really grateful for all the time that literally the C-suite makes to think about issues related to meta and to hear about the work we're doing. Um, and a third one is to actually be integrated into the machine learning team. So if you wanna impact the technology, you have to be with the people building it. You can't be a, a side function. Um, and you know, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong, we, we may be the only applied team that is both engineers and researchers. And we do, we take the applied part of the research pretty seriously. Um, my team does not do sort of theoretical research. We are looking at Twitter. We are looking at Twitter's models and we're looking at Twitter's impact on the world. Um, and then the decisions they make inform what the engineering team is building and what we're doing. We're also adding functions to do model audits. So I wanna build an entire team that just does audits of models. And these are like norms that we have to establish in the company. Um, so I do think a team like mine is a little bit unique. And I hope that the way we, we are constructing it and the way that it is evolving um, can serve as a blueprint for other companies. So speaking about the audit models that you want to start implementing, are there short and some long-term goals that you do have for the team? Yes, there are. Um, so one really cool thing we've done is, you know, we've been drawing a lot, learning a lot from our counterparts in cybersecurity and privacy. And it's, you know, it's good to know that there have been people before us who have asked very similar questions, maybe not the same questions, but quite similar ones. And they face very similar challenges, right? Um, and, you know, security is probably the best analog. And it's great because they're kind of like, 
our big sibling, right? They've been through this. They've done this for the, you know many more years than we have. So we can look to them and say, hey, how did they mature? And what can we learn on how we mature? So um, short-term goals is, you know, how do we create a lightweight way of doing quick model risk identification, model assessments? Uh, one thing my team has been working on is how do we create a standardized way of doing audits internally that's still flexible to context-specific needs, but also standardized enough that we can benchmark and compare models to each other or even compare models over time? How do we start normalizing a cadence of like how often does a model need to be audited and reviewed and what do we ask? Um, so it's all really fascinating because it can be a little frustrating because, you know, you're breaking new ground, of course, but it's fun because, you know, we're we're making it up as we go along and we're like refining what we're building. But here's where the engineering comes in, right? What's really interesting about having an engineering team is there are some aspects of the information we need that can actually be automated in how we're gathering it. So, for example, how many people are working on a project and what data set are they accessing and what variables are they using? If I have an engineering team who's building out that infrastructure, I don't actually have to go and ask people. I can gather that information. How do we monitor models over time? If we have this measurement of, let's say, you know, how a model is doing, um, again, that's like model monitoring stuff. So short-term goals, create the kinds of tools we need to audit models. And then longer-term goals is actually to create a standardized you know, and repeatable way of doing these audits and really like, how do we do them faster? Um, and, but balance that with quality, right? Because at the end of the day, instead of going back to like, what have I studied and what have I done? If I were purely a mathy person, I would say, yeah, yeah, we got to go faster. But the qualitative half of me is like, yes, but we have to be careful. So it's always this tension of like, how do we balance uh, the need to move fast with the need, you know, to be careful and to be thoughtful. So as you talk about how, you know, you guys are developing new methods and you're really breaking ground on a lot of what you're doing, what would you say are the skill sets that students need to develop to work in the responsible tech space? Yeah, I mean, since I've been doing a lot of hiring on my team, I can tell you exactly the people uh, who we have looked for and the kind of backgrounds we've looked for. I mean, number one is that, you know, Within research, there are probably a lot of people who've been doing it for a while. We have some really wonderful interns with us who are specialized in responsible ML. Some of our user researchers are as well. But for engineering, you know, as I mentioned, there is not that much of a background. So the things I look for, one is like a person who's very careful and methodical. And I guess everyone kind of looks for that. But also, you know, when we are doing the work we do, we have to be very inclusive and thoughtful on how we think. Someone who's a good planner and organizer. So can you sort of construct in your head and write down on a piece of paper how you would approach a problem in a structured and formulaic way? You know, to take a step back on like, what is it we're trying to do, right? The kind of work we do sounds like it's too much to wrap your arms around. And unsuccessful teams and unsuccessful endeavors tend to try to bite off more than they can chew or take little nibbles everywhere and then you're not moving the needle. So I really look for people who can be very strategic and be systematic in their approach to say, okay, we wanna solve this problem. Here's what we can solve today and here's how we move the needle moving forward. And I need people who are thinkers like that, especially for again, trying to create order out of chaos. I'm trying to make structure here where there hasn't been structure. Um, for researchers, you know, so that's engineering. So also one thing that's really helped, especially on my team, are people who have some sort of infrastructure engineering background. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we're making the kinds of tools for model monitoring, for testing your models when you are building it, or like test environments. So having some sort of infrastructure background is helpful. For the researchers, a wide range of people. Um, Currently, we have Dr. Sarah Roberts, who is the co-director of the Center for uh, Center for Critical Internet Inquiry at UCLA and the author uh, of Behind the Screen. Um, she has been working with us to do some research into a concept we call algorithmic choice, which involves enabling user agency. Um, we have a bunch of stellar user researchers working with us who are really talented in understanding customer needs. So often when you are on a team like Meta or doing this kind of work, you are building something for a customer, right? So, you know, if you want engineers to adopt the tools you're building, you have to understand their mindset and how they work and you have to make things that they will find useful and easy to use. Um, it would not be a success state if I build things that I think I need for the purposes that I want to solve and then expect everyone to use it. So that sort of customer-based mindset is really helpful. Um, and also people who are really good at being collaborative. So this, this field 
uh, is huge and it's very wide ranging and it takes a wide set of talents. So I really need people on this team who want to work with other people, um, you know, who want to collaborate with each other and who want to learn with each other. And I guess the last thing I'd add is intellectual curiosity. Every single person on my team is like constantly in a state of like intellectual FOMO is the way I put it, where it's like, oh, this person is doing something really cool. Like, I want to sit on this. I want to learn that. And that has been my favorite, favorite part of just looking at the Slack channel for my team is how many people are like sharing cool papers and like talks they just saw and everyone's reading everything and consuming everything and talking about it. And pivoting a little bit, what would you say um, or how does knowledge about responsible AI or tech look like on the ground? Um, that's a that's a really good question as well. So I suppose another way to think about that question is like, how would you market your skills to get a job, or you know, what does it mean to practically do this uh, in the day to day? It varies a lot, of course, by what sort of level you're working at. I think when folks are new to the role, there's a lot of learning, a lot of shaping and structuring. Um, so, for example, a lot of the researchers on my team are, you know, figuring out how to craft good research questions, um, understand the data and the systems that we use. So Twitter, because of the nature of the data that we have, like the size and scale and the velocity of it, like how much of it we have, we have, you know, totally different systems um, than folks may be used to. So learning how to operate within those technologies, people might be a little bit unfamiliar with. Um, you know, so, and what the knowledge looks like on the ground is, you know, a lot of explaining and collaborating with other teams. You're constantly learning about other teams' models, how they've built it, what was their logic behind how they built it. And then, you know, thinking through, you know, sort of the scenario planning of how do we figure out systematically how to uncover biases? How do we do a root cause analysis and how do we do a mitigation? I think one of the biggest challenges when you're doing this job, but it's also one of the benefits if you're Frankly, I always feel like I'm very fortunate to be at Twitter where we're asked to solve problems, not just identify problems. But solving problems is really hard, right? So one can find that there's race-based race, race biases in our models. It is not always evident where it comes from. And that, that is simultaneously really tough, but is also very rewarding because it's, you know, I don't know, I don't think most people who are in this field are attracted to it because it's easy, because it's not easy at all. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot of critical thinking skills that you use on, on the day-to-day, -day, um, a lot of interpersonal skills, as well as like deep tech coding programming um, and just sort of technological understanding. So when you're trying to find the source of these problems, you know, that you were talking about where, you know, race bias might be coming in, how do you tackle these issues? What might your day look like? Uh, doing that? Yeah, so Twitter is really a really fascinating place um, because it is a true example of a socio-technical system, right? So our algorithms don't exist in a bubble. They are personalization algorithms. Let's say we look at Twitter as like your home timeline. You open it and you're like getting a bunch of stuff recommended to you. Um, there are many models working under the hood, but let's just pretend there's like one experience, right? So when you go on Twitter, there are things you are looking at, there are things you're liking and not liking and things you're muting and things you're adding, right? And all of those, we call those signals, all those signals are being picked up. And your personalization is a function of that, as well as like some other things like geographic location or like things you might be interested in, all the stuff you kind of see when you go on your timeline. So when we look at algorithmic bias, it could be because there is some parameter in our model that's poorly specified or bad data or something, or it could just genuinely be that some, some, some subset of people do things a particular way. So there's a lot of research on homophily, especially on social media, like people find like-minded or like people. Um, so if I'm finding that there is some sort of a bias based on uh, sexual orientation, it could just be that queer Twitter is a thing and it's a support network and people love talking to each other and learning from each other and, you know, finding friends, et cetera. So we're not here to break that up, but then it's kind of fascinating to think about like, is that like, it would theoretically be defined as a quote bias, but it's not a bias because it's just how users interact. So that's kind of one of the fun parts of like, when we do a mitigation, there's a way we think about it as, is there some problem with the model as it lives in a bubble, like in a laboratory? But then when we put it into the world and people are interacting with it, a couple of things may happen. Like people may use it in a way we didn't think they would use it, 
Or, you know, people may collectively have a way of using it that's different across different groups and biases, quote biases could re- result or like different, different outcomes can result as, as a result. So with the many different challenges that you face within this team, and then, you know, you've been saying that you are hiring a lot. I was wondering uh, how specialized are those individuals that are being hired and what's the average education level? Um, that's a great question. So most of the people, most of the researchers on my team, all of the researchers on my team have PhDs, um, varying level of, you know, for some it's their first job either PhD program. Um, for others, they've been working and, and been in academia for years. So that just sort of changes what level you're at. Um, it varies for engineering. I think engineering is a little bit different in that it's more about like how many years you have worked. That being said, you know, we just hired a junior engineer on my team who was fresh out of her master's program. Um, and then we have folks that are more senior that have like decades of research, uh, decades of engineering experience. So it, it varies a lot. Um, and, you know, what we look for is a good fit with the team, you know, good critical thinking skills, as I mentioned, as well as, you know, currently a certain degree of programming ability. Um, that being said, you know, our user researchers have a mix of backgrounds and not all of them are purely quantitative. Um, we have a lot of amazing qualitative researchers. So I mentioned Dr. Roberts earlier. Dr. Roberts is a qualitative researcher and that's why her skills are so valuable. She's helping us understand what users think of algorithms, You know what the people on our platform think when they're thinking about the Twitter algorithm and how they interact with it and how they want to interact with it. So all of it's really valuable, wide range of skills. So with the wide range of skills available and because it is a relatively new space, how do you think responsible uh, tech space should develop? And do you see in the future people actually being, you know, having their careers specifically in this space instead of being pulled from other directions? Yeah, so I am very optimistic and very hopeful when I see so many individuals either specializing within their degree programs or just formally taking degrees uh, that involve ethical and responsible use of tech, right? That did not exist until very, very recently. So it's really wonderful that there's going to be this wave of folks who are actually educated and like knowledgeable about this field. And I'm already seeing it in some of our interns who are doing this work in their in their PhD programs, et cetera. Like this was not possible a few years ago. You couldn't find, you couldn't find these folks. Um, so I'm really optimistic when I see that. Um, I think, you know, what I hope actually is that the field of responsible ML starts to run into the same questions data science did uh, a little less than 10 years ago. So I came to Silicon Valley to be a data scientist in 2013. Um, I you know, was probably one of the earlier waves of professionalized data scientists. I wasn't like an original data science, like, you know, from like Yahoo or whatever, but I was that first wave of like people who were kind of being hired for this job. Um, and at that time, a lot of the conversation was, oh, like how should data science be structured? Should it be a standalone team or should you have embedded data scientists within teams that are serving this function? So where I, where I hope is that this field heads in a direction where we are asking those questions, right? Should we have embedded ethical, ethical technologists or public interest technologists working with different teams or should we have a core team kind of like the way my team is structured today that is like the sole you know, experts or like the experts on this. And the other thing I hope is that to a varying degree, this becomes a standard part of all technology education so that people who are trained public interest technologists are tackling these like big, meteor, harder problems. And we have moved beyond this, the space of like, here are the basic tools you need and the basic education you need. So if there's one thing that you could change about the tech industry, and I know we've discussed a lot through this conversation, what do you think that would be? Uh, only one, huh? <laughs> Many things. Um, you can give a top three. I, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think I can think about it just sort of in in one way that's like, maybe it's because just top of mind, that's literally something I'm thinking about today, right? Um, how do we incentivize the use of technology for the public good or the public interest in, in embedded in the structure of how businesses are constructed, right? So 
teams like mine and even like risk and compliance, privacy and security will not fundamentally be successful unless these things are a core part of how people are incentivized. Um, and that would be one thing I would change. And we have seen the needle moving on things like diversity and inclusion, for example, but that has only happened once companies started linking promotion to diversity. So, you know, this is not to take a cynical view of the world, like we're all busy people, we're all, you know, trying to utility maximize. We're going to take a look and be like, hey, what's my path to promotion? What do I need to do to get a good performance review? And then I want to do all the stuff that's like the ethical work. But let's be real, like when push comes to shove, you are going to optimize what you're building based on how you're measuring success. So if I would take a wand and change something, I would add measures of success um, built into the core, into core business functions and core business measurements that have to do with public interest tech. Okay. And then um, my last question that I have for you, where do you imagine or even where do you want this field to be in the next five years? Uh, I have very lofty ambitions for where I would want this field, field to be in five years. Um, I hope that um, not just social media companies, but all companies building technology are able to be more open and transparent. And this is going back to the VC fund. Um, this is why we're investing in privacy preserving ML. Um, you know, I think there are good technical solves for improving the kind of transparency we need to hold companies accountable. I think that, you know, hopefully in the next five years, we have better established standards, guidelines, regulations, even norms in our industry, where if someone's like, hey, I conducted an audit, we all know what that means. We have a standard that we hold it to, and we're able to say that's a good audit or a bad audit, or, you know, you missed this, or you didn't do that, or, you know, you did a great job. Um, I hope that the term public interest technologist is something that all companies are actively hiring for, also in very senior positions. Um, I hope that more companies uh, sort of elevate leadership roles in, in these functions. So, you know, there should be a VP of ethical use of technology. Uh, and very few companies today have a C-suite kind of roles. Um, and I would love to see more, you know, if I were to call it something, it would be like an ethics ceiling where we do hit our heads a little bit. And I would love for roles like ours to be elevated more into core business functions. Okay, and if you could give um, a quick snippet of what would your message be for students who are interested in getting in the field of public interest technology and how they should pursue that? How should a student pursue public interest technology? I would say have a broad skill set. I think it is the most valuable when you are in this field, when you can put on many hats and think about many things. Um, Yep, that would be my advice. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Chaudhry. And with that, I'm going to close and hand it back to Mona and Matt.